We're going to be reading the story of one woman's encounter. Now, I've put a piece of artwork up here, and I want to take just a moment before we read the Scripture. This artwork, I don't know if you value artwork. I do, but I appreciate this. This is the woman at the well, and if you look at this artwork, the artist was very uh, intentional about what he did. It has the water running through her heart, and if you notice behind her, you can see the dry, arid regions in which she lives, and so this was an intentional design by the artist, and it comes from this book here called Eyewitness, and I want to just promote this for just a moment. If you have someone that enjoys beautiful artwork, they've used different illustrators from all over the world, but this eyewitness uh, visual Bible experience, it's not a Bible, it's not meant to replace your Bible, but it tells major stories of the Bible in the first person, in their own first person experience. And so uh, a lot of it comes directly out of Scripture, but it's filled with many beautiful pictures like the one I've displayed there. And I'm telling you about this so I know Christmas is coming up. If you have somebody that you would like to get interested in the Bible, reading the Bible, if you have somebody maybe that's uh, uh, pre-adolescent or someone like that that um, would enjoy art or somebody that just enjoys beautiful artwork, this would be a beautiful thing. So I'm going to have this available. I'll set it here in this seat here if you'd like to come look at it. Um, There's some hand sanitizer. If you would just sanitize your hands before looking at it, it would be the only thing but it would make a lovely gift for somebody at Christmas. So turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 4. And this is a kind of lengthy reading, so I'm going to ask uh, four people to come, or three other people to come and help me read. And uh, we're going to kind of take turns reading different parts of this. But John chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. Follow along with us, please. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and And in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. 
I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Why are you talking to her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And all the saints said, Amen and amen. Thank you all so much for your help. Phil, I'm going to switch to the wireless. two bars and we are live. Did you catch the passage of scripture there in verse 3? The first one reads, said, now he had to go through Samaria. I want you to keep in mind this is the same Jesus that when Jairus came to him and said, my daughter is sick at the point of death, that Jesus took his sweet time. He didn't run. In fact, you remember that's when the woman touched the hem of his garment and he paused and he had conversation and he did a teaching and he did healing. And then as he delayed, supposedly, Jairus' daughter died. How many of you remember that story? This is the same Jesus that when they came to him and said, your friend Lazarus is sick at the point of death, that he lingered around two more days. It took him four days to get there and Lazarus died. How many of you know that Jesus never got in a hurry? He was never forced to do anything. But yet here, the scripture opens up and says, he had to go through Samaria. In other words, I have to do this. Have you ever been told by somebody, you have to do this? Right? You have to clean up your room. You have to do something. Jesus had, there was something that compelled him to go through this place called Samaria. What was it? It was the Spirit of God. He felt compelled by the Spirit to go through Samaria. And you have to understand that Samaria was kind of out of the way from where he was. He went, and I want you to understand, church, that he had a divine appointment with this woman at that well. This was not an accident. This was not a circumstance. God had preordained and predestined that Jesus would go there to have this meeting with this woman at the well. And the same thing can be said for every one of you and for me, that Jesus will go out of his way to meet you where you are. Some of you, he had to go a mighty long way. Amen? Some of you, he had to reach out into the throes of sin. 
Some of you, he had to kind of slap around a little bit to get your attention. Others of us, we were tender-hearted. And he just reached at us in the middle of a church service. But how many of you know we were all in the same boat? It didn't matter if you were brought up in church or if you were out in the throes of sin. You still needed Jesus Christ. And he went out of his way to meet you in the place where he could extend his hand to you and bring you into salvation. Now, I want you to get a snapshot of Samaria. I want you to understand what, what made Samaria what it was and why were the disciples saying, why is he talking to this woman? You see, Samaria was a place that was actually captured by the Assyrians uh, back in 2 Kings 17. You can read about it. And when the Assyrians captured a land, they had this uh, thing that they did where they co-mingled with the people. So what they would do is they would take some of the people out of the land. So when they came into uh, Manasseh and the, the tribe there, they took some of the people out of the land of Judah, out of the land of Israel, and they would take them into Assyria, but they would also take some of the Assyrians and then plant them in among the Jews in their own land. And the purpose was to break up the religious culture of the people in the towns that they invaded. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. The Jews, while they still continued some forms of Judaism, they also mingled in with the, uh, uh, with the Assyrians' idolatry. And they began to worship the Baals and the Ashtaroths. And not only that, but they began to co-marry. How do you know the Bible forbids a believer from marrying an unbeliever? It was a very weak response. How many of you know the Bible forbids a believer from marrying an unbeliever? It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship has light with darkness? Right? So the Jews had violated their own uh, laws, and they had uh, married into these people, and they became what was known as the Samaritans, and the Jews looked at them as being half-breeds. And it wasn't just this action that took place, but also under evil King Manasseh, they decided to build their own temple, one that would rival the one in Jerusalem. Now, how many of you know that was forbidden, right? But on Mount Gerasim, in fact, uh, Manasseh actually got permission from Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great gave him the permission to build this temple. So they had a, a, a competing temple with the one that was there in Jerusalem. And so because that was forbidden, the Jews, were de uh, the Jews despised the Samaritans. They considered them unclean. They considered them as pagans. They considered them as defiling the true worship that was supposed to take place in Jerusalem. It was said by the Jews that rather than associate with a Samaritan, they had rather drink pig's blood. Now, if you know anything about Judaism, you know that they considered pigs to be an unclean animal. And you also know that their law... Uh, forbid them from eating an animal without first draining the blood. So they were not supposed to eat the blood or eat pigs. So they were saying, rather than associate with a Samaritan, I would rather defile myself by drinking pig's blood. This, I'm trying to give you a picture for how much they disdained and disliked. And separate. In fact, when Jews were traveling, they would actually take more time and walk around Samaria so they wouldn't even get close to those people and have anything to do with them. I want you to get this picture in your mind of how much the Jews despised and hated at the Samaritans. But I also want you to understand that really the Samaritans are very similar to the people of the United States of America. We have so existed for so long with pagan people that we are adopting the ideals and the culture of the world and bringing them into the church and bringing darkness into the church instead of the church being the light of the world in these times of darkness. Amen? I don't know how many of you noticed, but this past week, Pope Francis, the, the chief leading person of the Catholic Church, said that he endorsed civil unions for same-sex couples. And now the Catholic Church has joined several other denominations and have bowed down to the pressure of the world and have declared something that is immoral in the sight of God as acceptable in the light of the church. And we are living in a time where more and more there are fewer people that are standing up for true righteousness and holiness and are standing by the Word of God. But as long as I'm the pastor of this church, as long as God will give me strength, 
Let us be a people that believe the word of God is true. Amen? And that stand upon the principles and the precepts of the word of God. We cannot compromise. No matter how much they threaten us. No matter if they tell us that we're having hate speech. I don't hate anybody in the LBGT community. I love them. I pray for them. I try to honor them when I deal with them in public. I try to be kind to them. I love them. I don't hate them. But I'm not being kind to them by lying to them and not telling them the truth about what is going to happen as the end result of their lifestyle. You're not helping me by patting me on my back when you see me sinning. Now, you don't have to throw it up in my face every time I see you. I hope that's not the first thing that comes out of your mouth. Amen? Because you know what? I'm not going to hang around you very much. I want you to love me first. If you love me, let me know. And if you don't, then let me go. That great theologian, Olivia Newton-John. A couple of tidbits in verse 6 I want you to pick up on. Did you notice it said that Jesus, as tired as he was, Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the Son of God. He was fully human. Yes, he was a Son of God, but remember, he stripped himself of all of his godly powers, and he came and he lived on this earth as a mere man. Everything Jesus accomplished in this life, he accomplished as a man that was totally submitted to the will of the Father. And that's why the Bible said that he was given the Spirit without measure. But notice Jesus' humanity. He got tired. He got frustrated. Yes, he did. He got frustrated at times with his disciples. He got frustrated. He got angered with the Pharisees. He wept. He cried. He had emotions. He was a man just like you and me. And then also notice it said that it was about the sixth hour or it was noon. Now, this is a significant little tidbit because most of the women came out to the well in the morning to draw the water while it was still cool, and water was necessary for almost all of the functions, the, from the watering of the animals until the washing of clothes, the bathing of themselves, any uh, ceremonial rites they had to serve, water was vital and necessary, and the women would typically go to the well early in the morning and go, and the, a lot of the wells in those times actually had stairwells that they would walk down into, and they were really more like cisterns. They just held rainwater, and water was kind of collected in there. And uh, so she is going at the noon hour. Now, that tells you something about this woman. She doesn't want to be there when other women are there. And it's not because she's so righteous that she doesn't want to join in the, the gossip that these women are going to be entering into. She doesn't want to be there because she knows she's the subject of the gossip. So she's avoiding these other women by coming at a time when nobody else was there in the heat of the day in the noontime hour. And then also notice a couple of things. Notice that Jesus was not concerned with ethnicity. He was not concerned with political or religious wranglings. He didn't care that this woman was a Samaritan. He wouldn't have cared if she was a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, or an Independent. Amen? Those things weren't what concerned him. Now, I'm not saying that these things don't matter. What I am saying is that the primary concern that Christ had is the same primary concern that we should have, and that is the souls of men and women. He wanted to bring her into a loving relationship with the Father, and that was his primary focus. And then I want you to notice that Jesus used tact. That's something we can all use a little bit more of in these times. Amen? Amen? Not just in our interactions with people face to face. I, I don't know that that's the problem so much as it is when we're on social media. You know, people get brave when they're on social media. People get daring and they get stupid. I didn't say that. I just heard it coming from over here. Notice that the first thing that Jesus said to her, he didn't say to her, you better turn or burn, woman. His first words to her wasn't, you going to bust hell wide open unless you change your ways. He used a little tact. 
he found some common ground. They were both thirsty. They both were in need of water. So he used that common ground of where he was to engage in a conversation with the woman. You know, we could all use a little more kindness. How do you know that that's one of the fruit of the Spirit? Is kindness. Just because we disagree with somebody don't mean we have to hate on them. Amen? You know, there's a lot of people since the COVID-19 virus that, that they've been kind of just kind of slow coming back to church. And, and you know, we don't need to try to, we, we want people to come back. But, you know, you can't force somebody to come back. And let me say this, when they do come back, use a little tact. Don't say to them, where you been? What's been wrong with you? We want people to know we missed you. We loved you. We're glad you're here. Don't make them feel like they did something wrong. And can I just tell you something? I'm going to wear a mask regardless of people telling me, well, you know, that shows you got fear. Oh, well, you know, you, you don't have enough faith that you wouldn't be wearing that mask. Listen to me. Now, this has not got anything to do with a sermon, but I'm just going to tell you how Stafford... I'm going to wear my mask until the Holy Spirit tells me not to wear a mask. Okay? And if you don't want to wear a mask, don't try to make them feel like they're ignorant for not wearing a mask. They're doing what they feel led to do. Amen? So let's walk with a little more kindness. A little more. When somebody comes back that hasn't been here since COVID broke out, love on them. You can't hug them, I know, but just tell them, man, it is so good to see you. We've missed you. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Here's why. We cannot impose our convictions on someone else. You can't do it. That belongs to the work of the Holy Spirit. But Paul said this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He said, look. I'm, you know, I eat meat, but if I'm with a brother and eating meat offends him, I won't eat meat when I'm around him. In fact, he went on to say, I won't ever eat meat again. I don't know if I could go that far. <laughs> but seriously, do you understand the point? He was saying, if something is offensive to somebody, then I'm not going to offend them. So if, if it's offensive in the wearing of mask or social distancing or whatever, let's not be offensive. Let's honor what the other person desires and wait until the Holy Spirit convicts them as to what they should do. And that's not just true about wearing masks. That's also true. And I'm not talking about basic doctrines of the Bible. There's some things that can't be uh, argued over. When, if we're talking about Jesus is the only way, Jesus is the Son of God, the Bible is the uh, unfallible, inspired Word of God, those are not things that we can discuss. Amen? Those are not up for debate. But when it comes to personal convictions about wearing a mask or different things, let's show kindness And let's let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. Am I doing all right this morning? Let's use a little tact. That's that's the point I was making. Let's use tact like Jesus did. So Jesus says to this woman, said, If you knew who I were, was, am, and going to be. Let's just hit all of them. He says, You would have asked me for living water. Now, he's making a spiritual metaphor. I want you to notice the woman doesn't get it. She's confused. She continues to talk about things in the natural. But Jesus says to her, he said, you would have asked me for living water. In the Greek, it's the word hudarzon, which means running water. So it doesn't just mean living water. It could also be interpreted as running water. So he, the woman could have interpreted saying, you would have asked me for a river or, or, or a spring of water. And so she's confused by this spiritual metaphor. And Jesus said, if you drink this water here out of this well, you will thirst again. Church, that can be said of all earthly appetites. No matter what your thirst is, if your thirst is for money, you can make as much money, you can double the amount of money you made this year, next year, and you will still want more. If your longing is for acceptance, if your longing is for success, if your longing is for status, you can climb the ladder. And by the way, the higher up the ladder you go, the more your rear end shows. 
You can climb the ladder of success, but that appetite, you will always want another position. It will never satisfy you. If, if, if you're trying to satisfy that craving with sex, you can have sex and you can have sex, and you can, but you will never be satisfied. You'll always want to have one more encounter. Maybe I need to try this. If your thirst is after drugs or the next high, you'll always pursue the next high, the next drug, the next new thing, and you will never, ever be satisfied. You will thirst again. There is no earthly thing that can satisfy the God-shaped vacuum that's inside of every one of us. Amen? And that's what Jesus is saying. If you drink this water, you will thirst again. But in contrast, he says, if you drink the water I'm giving you in the Greek, it actually means never, ever. Now, you know, it, it, and that's for emphasis. Now, you know, we don't, in the South, we don't always follow grammatical rules. How do you know a lot of times if you really want to make a point down in the South, you say, well, I ain't never going to do that again. How many of you ever say that, right? That's just the way we talk down here. That is a double negative. You're not supposed to say ain't never. You're probably not supposed to say ain't. Why? But in this scripture here, Jesus really is saying you will never, ever. He is making a point of emphasis. Once you drink of the living water, you will never, ever thirst again. That's his desire. Because he said once you drink of this water... It should begin to produce, now listen, it should begin to produce inside of you a spring that flows up and out and actually can nourish and give water and refreshment to others. Amen? So it's not just about you drinking in, but it says once you taste this water, this water actually has the ability to ignite something. It was like priming the pump. A lot of y'all don't remember back in the day, but we used to have hand crank pumps, Right? And the best way to get water out of it, you kept a can there with water in it. And you would pour that water down in it, and it would uh, soften up the gaskets and all of that. And that was what they called priming the pump. And once you primed the pump, you poured a little water in and kept pumping directly, the water would come out from the ground and begin to flow and flow and flow out of that pump. That's what he's saying. Once you prime the pump, once you accept Christ into your life, it ignites something and you can begin to pump out from inside of you that living water that gives life not only to others but also even in your own life. Amen? How many of you have that spring of living water flowing out of you? You know what I'm talking about today. Hallelujah. Amen. Overflow. Praise God. So he gives her this example, but she still doesn't get it. She's still thinking in the natural. But she's thinking, hey, this is a pretty good idea. If I could drink some water, maybe she thinks he's a magician. Maybe he thinks she's, he's some kind of a chemist. He's got some kind of special water that she could drink and never get thirsty again. She said, man, give me some of that water. I'm tired of lugging this big jar around, coming out here in the heat of the day. She's thinking in the natural, and she still lacks the spiritual understanding, but at least now she's interested. See how Jesus worked her? Huh? He got her interest. She says, at least now she's asked for it, right? She doesn't even understand it, but at least she's asked for it. Now, listen to me. Understanding is never a prerequisite for receiving the things of the Spirit, in fact, if we waited to, there's still things I don't understand about the moving of God's Spirit. If you had to understand how the Spirit operates, you would never receive the things of God. You just have to have the hunger. How many of you know there's a lot of people that have their South Carolina driver's license that they really don't understand the rules of driving here in South Carolina? Right? There are many people that don't know anything about marriage, but they went to the courthouse and they got a marriage license anyway right? So understanding is not a prerequisite for receiving. And this woman doesn't understand. She's still thinking in the natural, but at least now she has asked for it. And Jesus said, she asked, I'm going in. Hallelujah. But there's just an issue here. There's just a little minor issue here. She has to deal with sin in her life. Now, notice how Jesus uses his tact again. 
He's not only going to use tact, but he's also going to use the Holy Spirit. He says, go and get your husband. And this woman is a sly old fox. She says, I don't have a husband. And she thought she was just going to slide underneath the radar. But Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Because you've had five husbands, and the one you shack him with now is not your husband. So you answered truly, I have no husband. Now, I want you to understand, church, that Jesus did not give her that revelation because he was the Son of God. I want you to understand, because I I, I really am making the point in these messages that every one of us are to operate in this realm. Let me try it on this side. I want you to understand that what Jesus did here, God really wants every one of us to operate in this realm of the Spirit. It's not relegated to just a few people. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you as an individual. Jesus did not do this as the Son of God where he received the revelation because he was the Son of God. He did it as a man on this earth full of the Holy Spirit and he operated in the gift of the Spirit or what we call a manifestation of the Spirit. And this woman is moved now by this this word of knowledge that Jesus gives her and we see a shift. See, after he read her mail... We see a shift in her thinking. How many of you know she no longer called him a Jew? She said, I perceive you're a prophet. She's starting to move. See, you see how her spiritual level is also rising now. Why? Because of a manifestation of the Holy Spirit operating through Jesus Christ. And she asked Jesus this silly question, this silly religious question about where should we worship? Should we worship on Mount Gerasim or some say we worship? And you know, Jesus doesn't take the bait. He's not distracted. He kind of answers her question, but he gets back to the right. It's just like when you tell somebody, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior? And they say, well, I don't go to church anymore because the church is so full of so many hypocrites. I didn't talk to you about church. I'm not talking about church. Well, I don't go to church anymore because, you know, they started playing them praise songs and all them lights up on the platform and they quit singing hymns, so I quit going. That's not what we're talking about. People have all kind of religious ideas. We're talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus wanted to know. Have you drunk of the living water? Do you have a personal relationship with the living God? And this word of knowledge shifts this woman out of her fleshly thinking, and now she begins to move into the Spirit. And this is called a word of knowledge. Now, a word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation whereby the Holy Spirit reveals something about a person's past or present life to somebody that's operating in the Spirit. And so Jesus told her about her past and about her present life in that moment. And I want you to know, again, it's not for a select few. If you want to learn about the gifts of the Spirit, you can go on the encounter. And when we go through the School of Discipleship, we teach about the gifts of the Spirit. We still believe in the five-fold ministry, and we believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit operating in the church. Amen? We still believe in faith. We still believe in miracles. We still believe in healings. We still believe in words of knowledge. We still believe in words of wisdom. We believe in the discerning of spirits. We believe in prophecy. We believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in uh, interpretation of tongues. We believe in the five-fold uh, ministry, and we believe in the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We are a spirit-filled church, and we believe that the spirit is still operating in the lives of God's people today. He hasn't changed his mind. He didn't get tired of operating those gifts just when the disciples died. He is still active in the church world today. And so Jesus uses this, and he speaks to this woman, and he tells her some very important things. He gives her a revelation about her heart. But I want you to notice that Jesus uh, said something to her that I think is significant. And the church, once again, we've got to operate in these spiritual gifts. The time 
when you could go up to somebody and quote them scripture alone and then be convicted is almost over. Now, I believe there's power in the Word. I believe there's authority in the Word of God. But you're living in a time where many people don't believe that the Bible is even the Word of God. They just think it's a religious book. It's right up there with the Quran and the Book of Mormon and all like that. They don't understand it's the living, real Word of God. So you and I are living in a time where we have to be able to demonstrate not just the Word of truth, but we have to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's important for the church to begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Before somebody is going to be saved, it's going to require the work of the Spirit in their life. And that's going to mean that you're going to have to enter into a realm of intercession and pray the Holy Spirit convicts their heart or that God gives you a word of knowledge or something. And see, now some of you right now, when I'm saying that, listen, listen to me, listen to me. Some of you immediately when I say that, your mind, your flesh, or the devil begins to say, I can never do that. Lie. Tell the devil he's a liar. It's a gift for the church. And you and I are moving in a time, there's got to be a shift in the faith of the church where we believe that when we're praying for somebody, witnessing somebody, the Lord will give us the right words to say, be it a word of knowledge, be it a discerning of the Spirit, be it a word of wisdom, so that that person can know that the Spirit of God, the anointing of God is upon our life and they'll come under conviction. Amen? Amen? Look what the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 14.1. Read it aloud with me, would you please? Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. I want you to begin to desire the gifts of the Spirit. I want you, when you go to your prayer closet, I want you to begin to ask God, I want to pray in the Holy Ghost. I want to prophesy over others. I want to have where if you don't ask, you don't get Amen? And the Bible tells us we've got, a, we've got a, a direction here. Eagerly desire. It doesn't just say just desire it. It said eagerly. You've got to have the want to. Amen? Now, Jesus says something very significant here, and he demonstrates the role of Israel in redemption. God has ordained Israel as a means through which he would redeem the world. And Jesus even says in verse 22, he said, salvation is of the Jews. He said, you Samaritans don't know what you worship. In other words, he was saying, you have co-mingled the worship that God gave out you, the worship of Yahweh the Creator. And because you've co-mingled it, you don't even know what you're worshiping. You're worshiping some false god, not the true God. He said, the Jews, at least we know who we're worshiping. We're worshiping the Creator. But he said, the time is coming when neither one of these are going to be valid. And then he says, and the time now is. So what was he saying? He said, I am the one that has come to take the place of any other forms of worship because because God is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? But we have a big mistake that's going on in our world today, in our culture, even among Christians, and it's called replacement theology. And they think that the church has replaced the Jews because they rejected Jesus. But Jesus has always had a plan for the Jews. And when you read over in the book of Revelation and you read Isaiah and Jeremiah, you find that God, during the tribulation period, he is going to deal with the nation of Israel. And there's going to be many people of the Jews that come into the kingdom of God at that time. But you and I have to understand that our Christianity is rooted in Judaism. It is wrong for us not to pray, not to bless the people of God. Amen? Everything that we have, we, our Bible is a Jewish Bible. Have you know that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed? And that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed? All that you read in the Old Testament are signs and foreshadows that point to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The 12 disciples were Jewish. The laws of our land, they largely came from the Ten Commandments. Our Messiah, Jesus, is Jewish. Most of the early church was Jewish. So Christianity is rooted in Judaism. And if you look even at uh, at the Jewish feast, there were seven Jewish feasts. When was Jesus crucified? On the feast of what? Passover. He became the Passover lamb. So the feast... The Old Testament feasts, they weren't just commemorative, they were also prophetic. They would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ and are going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was crucified on Passover. What about the day of Pentecost? Pentecost was a Jewish feast. 
of first fruits. That was the first believers that came in. So we have to remember that God still has a plan for our brothers and sisters that are in Judaism. Amen? The worship that God is after is a balance of spirit and truth. This is what God is after. He's not after rituals. He's not after religion. He's not after churches that do great acts of service in the community. He's not after whatever works you can do. God is spirit. And he, through the death and the resurrection of his son, has opened a door into the heavenlies, whereby you and I can enter into the realm of the spirit and explore and experience the things of the spirit. Amen? And this is what he spoke of with Nicodemus when he said, unless you believe, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But those of us that are believers, we have now entered into that kingdom. And it is a supernatural kingdom. And it is the kingdom of God. And it is a spiritual kingdom. Hallelujah. But God is searching for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Everything that God embraces, God is the embodiment of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to know that the truth is in the middle of the way and the life. If you want to know about the way that you should live on this life and the way to eternal life, you've got to know the truth. If you want to know about life and life abundantly, you've got to know the truth. And the Word of God is the truth. The Logos. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. So we have to worship Him in the truth, and we've got to know the truth. And the gospel message is the very core of the truth of God. Not just about a historical Jesus that walked the earth some 2,000 years ago, that died on a cross and resurrected. But we believe that the Word of Truth gives us a plan for our lives as individuals today. But then it's not just enough to know the truth. There's a lot of churches that teach the Bible. A lot of evangelical churches, they do a very good job of teaching the Bible, teaching the truth. But they don't believe in the baptism. They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And you've got to have some oil on it, like I told you earlier. Amen? We still believe in signs and wonders. We believe in the anointing. We believe in the presence of God. We believe in being a Spirit-filled church. Amen? Amen? You've got to have both. He said, those that worship me, they've got to have the spirit and they've got to have the truth. If you only have the truth without the spirit, you run the risk of becoming dry and ritualistic. If you only have the spirit and you don't have the truth, you can get off into excesses and into emotionalism. It's important that you have the balance of the spirit and truth in our lives. But when you have the word, when you have the truth, you have the authority. And when you have the spirit, you have the power. And when you anoint and put together the authority of God's word along with the power of the Holy Ghost, the church becomes the church triumphant. And there is no force on this earth that can stop a church that worships God. God in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. So this woman, after hearing Jesus, says, I know that when Messiah comes, he's going to straighten us out on all that mess. And Jesus says, the one that's talking to you right now. Now listen to me, because there are skeptics, there are agnostics, there are atheists that claim that Jesus never said that he was God. They must have never read the Bible. Because right here, he says, the one that you're talking to, I am the Messiah. He didn't make any bones about it. He declared that he was the anointed one sent from God. Then the 12 disciples show up. Now, let me make a point here. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to become a mighty man or woman of God. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't use intellectual people. But I'm going to tell you, the disciples, they were a bunch of knotheads. Notice that it took 12 men to do what one woman can do. I don't know about you, but I just kind of imagine scenes like this, you know. Jesus says, uh, Judas, how about you and James uh, go into town and buy us some food to eat, you know. And so somebody said, somebody else needs to go along and keep an eye on Judas. And somebody else said, well, how come James and Judas gets to go? I never get to go. I want to go. And Jesus said, oh, you bunch of babies, why don't all of you just go? Just all go. I want to spend some time alone anyway. <laughs> Took 12 men to do what one woman could have done. But they come back 
And they see Jesus talking to this woman. Now, what you have to understand, in Jewish culture, it was not only against their culture for them to speak to a Samaritan, but even for them to speak to a woman in public. That's why in the book of Corinthians it said, let a man address his wife in the home. Because they didn't speak to women. The women had such, uh, they had such restricted rights at that time that they did not even speak to them in public. Could you imagine? Never mind. And so they, they don't understand what's going on, and so they try to get Jesus to eat, and Jesus said, man, I don't want to eat. I'm in the middle of something right now, man. They said, I wonder if somebody brought him something to eat. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of God. I'd rather see souls one into the kingdom of God than even eat. Do you understand that evangelism is at the very heart of God? And he goes on to explain to the disciples what his meat is, what his food is. The fields are ripe unto harvest. Open your eyes. He said, one sows and another reaps. Don't be upset sometimes when you witness and pray for somebody you don't see him one. Somebody else is going to come along. Some of those that you do lead to Christ, somebody else has already planted a seed. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. Amen? One sows, another reaps. It's a joint effort. And Jesus even said, you're reaping in a place you didn't sow. But I want you to know that evangelism is at the very heart of God. And if it's at His heart, it should be in our heart too. And relationships are at the very core of evangelism. How did Jesus win this woman? He entered into a relationship with her. When other men would have, would have scorned her, when other, women, uh, other men would not even have spoken to her, for various reasons, Jesus entered into conversation with those that were untouchable. He engaged her. He spoke with her. And then he spoke to her heart about her husband. And out of that relationship, she left her water jar. She left. She forgot what she was doing. It became the most important thing in her life. She goes out into the town and says, come and see the man that told me everything about my life. And then when the townspeople come, they ask Jesus to stay. Now remember, he's living, he's staying in a place that Jews did not even, they would walk around. He stays for two more days. He builds relationship. And the people said, we're not believing now just because of your words. We're believing because we heard the word for ourselves." Our church is about 75% where we were pre-COVID in attendance. About 75%. And from what we can tell from those that are watching online that we are a about where we were before when you add those numbers in as far as viewership. But let me say this. While I was blessed by watching on the computer, there's nothing that takes the place of being in the house of the Lord and feeling what we felt here today. I know that everybody has to come back at a time that you feel comfortable, but it's important for you to be involved in small groups. It's important for you to stay connected to the body of Christ. Because relationships are at the core of Christianity. Let me make this comparison of two encounters. Nicodemus had an encounter with God in John chapter 3. The woman dwelled well in chapter 4. Let's, let's make a comparison. He was a named man. She was an unnamed woman. He was a man of good report. She was a woman of ill repute. She had a poor reputation. He was a wealthy man. She was a poor woman. He came to Jesus. Jesus came to her. He was a social, there's that word again, aristocrat. She was a social outcast. Nicodemus was a Jew. She was a despised Samaritan. Nicodemus was religious. He was upright. He followed all the rules of the law. This woman was worldly. She was immoral. She was living in sin. Nicodemus did not have any immediate response to what Jesus said. This woman immediately went and told the town all the things that Jesus told her. To Nicodemus, Jesus was quite blunt. To the woman at the well, Jesus was tactful. To Nicodemus, he began by speaking of spiritual things. To the woman at the well, he began by speaking of natural things. I got this from Chuck Nistler. If anybody wants to listen to some of his teachings, he's tremendous at Cornelia House. Those are two totally different people, two totally different ways. But how many of you know they both encountered the living Christ? Amen? Totally different ways. That's why God can use every one of you. You hear me? 
Some of you have a bold approach. Some of you are blunt. Others of you, you build relationships. You're kind. You have that coffee cup evangelism. God uses all of us, and together we impact people's lives. True encounters with Christ. First of all, they're led by the Spirit. Jesus went there because it was Spirit-initiated, and nobody's going to be convicted unless the Holy Spirit convicts them. It often surprises the recipient. There's a lot of people out there don't know that they can actually encounter God, that God will speak to them. There's a lot of people that don't know that God can reveal things in their life to help them improve their station in life. It often surprises the recipient. The woman was surprised. Some people are surprised that God wants to bless them. God does want to bless people. Amen? How many of you know that? He might not approve their lifestyle, but he wants to bless them. He wants to bring them into the kingdom. True encounters often involves revealed truth. Somewhere the truth has to be revealed. The Word of God through a word of knowledge, through intercession. Did you notice the progression of this woman as she encountered Christ? First of all, she said, you're a Jew. Then she said, are you greater than our father Jacob? Then she said, I realize you're a prophet. But then she said, come see the Messiah. Did you see how she progressed in her relationship? Because a truth was revealed to her. And the word of God is central. In verse 41, they said, we don't believe now just because of what you said. We've heard his words for ourselves. You have to speak and declare the word of God. And they said, truly, he is the savior of the world. This is the first time that phrase is ever used in the Bible. And when there's a true encounter with God, church, hear me now, it impacts more than the individual. If you've had a true encounter with Christ, it's not just about you anymore. It's about who can I influence for the kingdom of God.